So as to make this a little bit easier, I divided this up into two lectures. This first one will be about the rise of absolutism in Central and Eastern Europe. And the second one will focus on the concept of enlightened absolutism and precisely what that meant for Europe in the 18th century. The state of Brandenburg, Prussia was born during the Middle Ages. Initially, it was a tiny landlocked state called Brandenburg. It was located on the Elbe River. Its claim to fame was that the Prince of Brandenburg was one of the German electors, one of those seven princes eligible to elect the Holy Roman Emperor. In 1618, the Hohenzollern ruler of Brandenburg, a convert to the Reformed theology, inherited the Duchy of Prussia. From the beginning of the 17th century, then, Brandenburg Prussia would slowly add territories on the Rhine and along the Baltic coast. Specifically, what they're going to add are the areas that we called Pomerania, which were located kind of right around this area, and they will also add a territory called Magdeburg, which was kind of south right here. Each of the territories had its own laws and representative institutions. These were known as estates. Basically, they were parliaments. These scattered lands are what the great elector of Brandenburg, Prussia, who was known as the great elector, Frederick William of Hohenzollern, had to weave together in order to build his absolutist state. As in France, the Thirty Years' War had sapped some of Brandenburg Prussia's resources. Uh, Frederick William then had to set goals for himself. What precisely was it that he wanted to do? Well, he knew that he needed to establish personal authority and that this was going to happen at the expense of the estates. He knew he wanted to found a strong standing army. He knew that he needed to create an efficient bureaucracy. And finally, he wanted to use all of those things to extend his territory. In order to accomplish his aims, Frederick William struck a deal with the nobles, the junkers of each land. He'd give them complete control over their peasants, and Prussian peasants had been increasingly insurfed since the late 15th century, and he said, I will allow you to have complete control over these people. I'll exempt you from taxes if you allow me to collect taxes from non-nobles in your territories. They agreed. Why wouldn't they? This was an extension of their own power. Now that he was supplied with a city income, Frederick William could concentrate on the creation of his military and the expansion of his bureaucracy. Over the next 40 years, so over the course of his reign, he is going to expand the army from 8,000 to 40,000. This is a standing army. The army ranks will mirror the social realities of the time. The Unkers become officers, peasants fill the infantry. The setup was strangely medieval, though. Um, it was the Yunkers who trained their own peasants, and it was the Yunkers who, in turn, vowed to serve the elector. So when Frederick William did need to raise an army, he had to go through the Yunkers to do so in this very sort of medieval way. The Yunkers would also fill bureaucratic positions in the government, although the military was undoubtedly the most important branch of the government. So important, in fact that Frederick William is going to create one of modern Europe's first state-sponsored postal services. This is going to facilitate the transmission of military dispatches across the state. Frederick William was a Calvinist, and as a Calvinist ruler, he wanted to avoid the elaborate court ritual that the Sun King had set up in France. He set himself up instead as a competitor to Louis XIV. When Louis revokes the Edict of Nantes in 1685, Frederick William welcomes about 20,000 French Huguenots into his kingdom, and he gives them jobs in the bureaucracy, even training his children. In addition, he often switches sides during Louis XIV's dynastic wars. He sometimes uses a threat of foreign invasion to strengthen his own hold on his people and on his army. While his feats were undoubtedly impressive, though, his efforts to create a strong Prussian state really could only happen because the other two big rival German states, which would be Saxony and Bavaria, were occupied with other struggles, and they weren't paying attention to his expansion of power. Saxony has close proximity to Poland, and that meant during this time that they were often drawn into the struggles of Poland, basically the last dying throes of Poland. And then Sweden's occupation of Saxony during the Thirty Years' War had meant that Saxony was also kind of tied into Sweden's political atmosphere. So they had a lot going on during the early part of the 17th century. Bavaria, in turn, was politically split between the authority of their secular dukes and the Catholic clergy. The Bavarian people were devoutly religious, and they often felt that their spiritual well-being trumped that of the Bavarian dukes' control. 
So the more they tried to centralize, the more the people resisted and went instead with the Catholic clergy. So Saxony and Bavaria were not able to centralize in the same way that Prussia was. Frederick William was so successful in building his absolute estate that when his son, Frederick I, asks the Roman, Holy Roman Emperor um, for his, uh, his inheritance, Emperor Leopold I allows him to use the title King in Prussia. And this was huge um, and a truly amazing uh, consequence. A Prussian official who will write during the reign of Frederick William's grandson comments that, quote, what distinguishes the Prussians from other people is that theirs is not a country with an army. They have an army and a country that serves it. So we really get a sense here of what it was they were doing. By the time we get to the reign of Frederick William's grandson, who was also named Frederick William, you have an army reserve set up in Prussia because King Frederick William I requires that all Prussian men serve two months during the summer in the Prussian army. And as a consequence of this, Prussia is going to have the most well-prepared army in comparison to any other country in Europe. Like the Prussian state, the Holy Roman Emperor, who initially here is Leopold I of the Austrian Habsburg family, he's going to rule over a variety of territories that encompasses a number of different ethnic groups, a number of different languages, and importantly, a number of different religions. Still, like the other wannabe absolutist monarchs, he's going to be able to consolidate his power. Like other Holy Roman Emperors since 1438, Leopold was the heir to a number of territories. So these are territories that he controlled directly. He was the Duke of Silesia. He was the Count of Tyrol. He was the Archduke of Upper and Lower Austria. He was the King of Bohemia, the King of Hungary and Croatia, the ruler of Styria and Moravia. Some of these were properties that belonged to the Holy Roman Emperors, and since the Habsburg family had held it for a long time, they were now theirs. Some of these were part of the Habsburg family holdings. Each of them had different traditions. So like Frederick William in Prussia, Leopold is having to balance these traditions with what he wants to do in his own state. Like any other Central European monarch, his power is going to come through the military. During the Thirty Years' War, the Holy Roman Emperor had largely hired mercenaries to do their fighting. After 1648, the emperors focused on building up a standing army because they didn't want to depend on mercenaries any longer. By 1672, Leopold was able to use his own army against Louis XIV successfully, so we know that this was a worthy endeavor. In order to gain support for his growing militarization, though, Leopold had to foster relationships with the aristocracy while chipping away at provincial institutions, again, very similar to what Frederick William had had to do in Prussia. Since the Bohemians had rebelled against the Holy Roman Emperor, that's what started the Thirty Years' War, the Holy Roman Emperors claimed Bohemia as one of their hereditary kingdoms, which meant that the Bohemians could no longer elect, choose, their own king. In addition, the Habsburgs promoted new noble families, and these were made up of anybody but Bohemians or uh, other potentially ethnic German groups. So Czechs, other Germans, Italians, Spaniards, even Irish were advanced over the Bohemians. Anyone was good so long as they spoke German, they were Catholic, and they were willing to serve the Habsburg family loyally. Unlike other Central European monarchs, the Holy Roman Emperors didn't just have to deal with internal political strife, though. They actually had to deal with external strife as well. And this was pretty significant because the majority of their external strife is going to come quite specifically from the coming in of the, uh, of the Ottomans, coming here from the east. Hungary was the chief area of contention between the Holy Roman Emperors and the Turks, and this was true for over 150 years. In 1682, war broke out between them yet again. The Holy Roman Emperor, um, who through his holdings controlled the northwest section of Hungary, came to support the Hungarian princes of Transylvania who were trying to break away from the Ottoman Empire. The Turks were demanding tribute from the Transylvanian dukes. In retaliation, the Turks push into Austrian-controlled Hungary. They get all the way in to the gates of Vienna. So this is the second time in uh, Habsburg memory that the Turks are coming this close. In 1687, the Habsburg dynasty's claim to the throne of Hungary was formally recognized by the Hungarian Diet, by their, by their parliament. The parliament had been revived by Leopold in 1681, precisely so they could accept the ruling of the Austrian king. 
With the help of the Polish cavalry, the Austrians were able to break the Turkish siege on Vienna. And with the Treaty of Karlovitz, which was signed in 1699, the Turks had to surrender almost all of Hungary to the Austrians. This was huge. Uh, it really shows that the Ottoman Empire is going to begin a very slow decline at this point in time. But it solidifies Leopold's hold over the Holy Roman Empire. Hungary's liberation did come at a great price. As much as 65% of the Hungarian population might have been killed since 1600. So as to repopulate the land, the Austrians decide to settle large communities of foreigners within Hungary. So they allow Romanians, Croats, Serbs, and Germans to settle in Hungary. As a result of this resettlement plan, Magyar or Hungarian speakers become a minority in their own homeland. And this is going to begin a very long road towards ethnic conflict, which is going to spark in the middle of the 19th century. And it'll continue to spark until the beginning of the 20th century. And as we see even more recently, even into the 21st century. What's really sad about this, at least from the Ottoman perspective, is that the Ottomans themselves were also interested in state centralization, but they went about it in a different way. They recruited mercenaries into their military, hoping that this was going to strengthen their military. But the end result was that the military starts to overtake the central government. Army officials assassinate raiding sultans. The result is this constant political turmoil. And as a result of that, the Ottoman state has to try to find new and innovative ways to deal with it. It's not going to work. And yet, the Ottoman absolutist state is going to outlast every other absolutist state in Europe. So they win the war of attrition. They just don't win it in a really pretty way. If we look at the rise of absolutism in Russia, basically what we see is a move from the medieval Muscovite state into a truly Russian empire. By the 17th century, Russia was already as large a state as it appears today, stretching from Europe in the west all the way across Siberia and to the Pacific Ocean. To visitors from the west, Russia appeared unbearably barbaric. Uh, the Russians in turn distrusted the west and all of its people. Still, the same political tensions were present in Russia as were present elsewhere in Europe. And the Tsars of Russia wanted absolute power, just like other European monarchs did. Tsar Ivan IV, known as the Terrible, who ruled from 1533 to 1584, he has been the one who was responsible for the expansion of Muscovy into Siberia. But he had failed in his attempt to expand Russia to the west. Upon his death, the Russian political scene was dominated by other states, primarily because Ivan had killed his son and heir in an angry fit. And so states such as Poland-Lithuania tried to influence the dynastic succession of Russia. This time period was known as the Time of Troubles in Russia, and it lasts until about 1613, when a group of Russian nobles place Michael Romanov on the throne of Russia. So the Romanov dynasty begins at that time. In 1648, one of the Romanov dynasts, Tsar Alexei, tries to extend state authority by imposing a new administrative structure in, in Russia. The people didn't like that very much. Moscow and the other bigger cities in Russia erupt in bloody rioting. The government uses the military, of course, to set down the rebellions. And then in 1649, Tsar Alexei convokes the assembly of the land. This is a sort of parliament which consisted of noble delegates from each of the provinces of Russia. The idea was that these delegates were going to help Alexei consult um, and create a new law code. And this code would create a strict social hierarchy so everybody would know where they belonged in the Russian society. The code that comes out of this convocation is the Code of 1649. It assigned all Russian subjects to a hereditary class according to their occupations at the time or according to the state's needs in 1649. Most notably, the slaves and free peasants in Russia were merged into a serf class. This was a class that was not allowed to change occupations or to move from their place. They were like the old medieval serfs. They were tied to the land and they were tied to their noble masters. Like farm animals, nobles were able to sell their serfs. So in a lot of ways, serfs were much more like slaves than they were traditional medieval serfs. The code also forbade townspeople from moving away from their communities. This way, the government could be assured of getting taxes because theoretically, communities could only grow in size and so the tax revenue base could only grow in size. Nobles were required by law now to serve in the army. 
no other group but nobles could own estates worked by the serfs. So you get the concentration of land in the hands of the nobility, the inability of townspeople to leave their towns, and the inability of people to change their occupation at all. And this was Tsar Alexei's solution to dealing with the chaos of, uh, of the 17th century. As we might expect, some peasants resisted the ensurfment. In 1667, Stenka Razin, a Cossack from the Don region in southern Russia, led a rebellion that promised liberation from the noble landowners. He was captured in 1671 by the Tsar's army, and he was dismembered at that time. So this image that you guys see here is him being paraded after his capture. Uh, his head and limbs were displayed after his dismemberment, and the rest of his body was thrown to the dogs, and they were allowed to eat it. Thousands of his followers suffered equally horrific deaths. Afterwards, the landlords petitioned successfully for the abolition of the statute of limitations on runaway serfs. They thought that this would stop riots such as that of Stenka Razin from occurring again. In Russia, then, increasing absolutism was marked by the increased ensurfment of a group of people, a class of people, who had formerly been free. Like other absolutist monarchs, Alexei is also going to focus on increasing the size of his army. It's going to rise from 35,000 troops in the 1630s to about 220,000 troops by 1700. Of course, he doesn't do this all on his own, but still, that's a quite dramatic increase in the number of soldiers. Alexei expands his control over the people in other ways. The assembly of the land, which had been so important to creating the Code of 1649, never meets again after 1653. So this ability to have a voice in government just goes away. In addition, Alexei enforces his control over the Russian Orthodox Church. In 1666, a church council reaffirmed that the Tsar had a role as God's direct representative on earth. So this was really the only state where the church recognized a sort of divine right for the Tsar. The state-dominated church then took action against a group who were known as the Old Believers. These were a group of people who were trying to reconcile Russian Orthodox practice with those of the older Byzantine tradition. They rejected the idea that the Tsar was God's representative on earth, um, and they tried to reinstitute the old Byzantine traditions um, of this autonomy for the state um, and the church in the state. The old believers were often tortured, they were imprisoned or exiled, and this discord opens up a religious schism between the Russian people and the crown, where the crown is always trying to assert its influence and authority over the church, and you've got people who are resisting that extension of power. Like other absolutist rulers, Alexei puts art in service to the crown. Um, and again, like other absolutist rulers, you have an increasing size in bureaucracy. Russian laws dictated activities as disparate as tobacco smoking and alcohol consumption, even the leashing and fencing of dogs. Western influence abounds in Russia at this time. The first Western-style theater opens in the Kremlin under Alexei, and his daughter, whose name was Sophia, translates French plays for performance into Russian. The nobility began to wear Western-style clothing. So even though there's a distrust of the West and its ideas, there is a sort of love affair beginning with Western culture, Western fashion. Absolutist Russia is going to profit from the decline of a neighboring state. This is Poland, Lithuania. Decades of war during the first half of the 17th century had resulted in political instability for the, the state of Poland, Lithuania. In 1648, the very same year that the Thirty Years' War ended, Ukrainian Cossack warriors took advantage of the instability and they revolted against the overlordship of Poland, Lithuania. The following two decades of war are going to be known as the Deluge. Nobles of Polish descent who claimed the rich lands of southern Russia and the Ukraine disdained the Cossacks as troublemakers. But in contrast to that, the Ukrainian peasants view the Cossacks as liberators and they contribute to the cause of the Cossacks. In 1654, the Cossacks are going to offer the Ukraine to Russia so long as Russia can help push Poland Lithuania out of the Ukraine. Russia accepts the challenge. This prompts the Russo-Polish War, 1654 to 1657, which finally ends with a Russian victory. Tsar Alexei is going to annex the eastern Ukraine and Kiev, and the neighboring powers, which include Sweden and Brandenburg, Prussia, and Transylvania, they're going to try to annex the other territories that had belonged to Poland-Lithuania. A particularly sad note 
to the constant warfare of the 17th century is the number of deaths due to fighting. Historians believe that about a third of the Polish population died over the course of time just from fighting. Once prosperous Jewish and Protestant minorities suffered the most, we think. Historians estimate that about 50,000 Jews were killed. Thousands more were forced to convert to Russian Orthodoxy under Alexei's rule. Surviving Jews moved from towns to shtetls, these are Jewish villages, and they took up activities which fanned anti-Semitism. These activities were things like petty trading, money lending, tax gathering. This was in service to the government, and yet it really implemented and extended those stereotypes. Desperate for protection, many Protestants backed the anti-Catholic Swedes. Well, the Catholic Poles viewed them as traitors. And so in the areas of Poland-Lithuania, which remained intact, they persecuted the Protestants um, as traitors. Tolerance was dead in Poland. After its decline, it was assumed by the government that a good Pole was a good Catholic. Anything else was completely unacceptable. The Commonwealth of Poland-Lithuania was briefly revived by Jan Sobieski. He ruled from 1674 to 1696 as elected king in Poland-Lithuania. It was he who leads the Polish army to help the Holy Roman Emperor in 1683, saving the Austrians from the Turkish siege on the city. However, despite Sobieski's close ties to the Holy Roman Emperor and to Louis XIV, uh, Sobieski marries a French princess, He's unable to establish the same absolute state in Poland as Louis had done in France and many others had done in their own states in Europe. Instead, the great Polish nobles gained control of the parliament. Um, this is called the, the Sej. And they managed to maintain a balance of power against the king. So the monarchy was hampered, it was increasingly powerless, and it made Poland right pickings for the much stronger territories around it, which are going to include primarily Brandenburg, Prussia, and Russia. If we were to designate one of the absolutists of the later 17th century as the best Louis imitator, I think it would have to be Peter the Great. This king, Tsar of Russia, was a, a truly magnificent sight to behold, I'm sure. At the age of 25, Peter, who was about seven feet tall, visits Eastern Europe, and he does so incognito. I'm not exactly sure how a seven-foot giant does this incognito, but nonetheless, we're told he did. He dresses as a humble workman, and he travels throughout Europe trying to get a handle on Western culture and Western ideas. He shocks Western statements, um, statesmen excuse me, and nobles with his coarse dress and, he, and his manners, and he finds, during his travels, and somewhat to his surprise, that he preferred the company of artisans and workers to that of the nobility of Europe. But Peter was incredibly impressed with the efficiency of the Western states, and it's he who takes these ideas and begins to implement them in Russia. It's under Peter's rule that parts of Eastern Europe first come under definitive Russian control, much of this, of course, being part of the former Polish-Lithuanian state. Peter's focus on the military meant that even during peacetime, two-thirds, two-thirds of the state revenue went to the military. In order to raise more money, a direct tax was levied on each male serf, and the responsibility for collecting those taxes fell on the noble landlords. In addition, the sons of the nobility had to attend new military and engineering schools. In fact, they weren't allowed to marry until they had done so. So Peter was ensuring that he had an educated workforce of nobles who would enter service to the state, right, who would become bureaucrats for the Russian government. Peter also borrowed Western technical knowledge and fashions. He went so far as to force Russian nobles to shave off their beards and begin using individual cups and glasses, bowls and napkins rather than group versions. So Russian culture held that you ate in family style. So everybody dug into a big old bowl of food. You had one cup that you passed around when you wanted to drink something. And Peter said, no, enough. We're going to adopt Western styles. A Western etiquette book was translated into Russian so that the nobility could learn how to act, and in furthering his insistence that Russia begin to look more Western, he ordered the building of Western-style palaces and the wearing of Western-style clothes. German and French, as opposed to Russian, became the languages of the court. So the Russian court began looking more and more Western by rule of the, of the Tsar himself. Determined to be a patron of the arts, Peter began collecting German and Italian paintings. This collection would later become the Hermitage Museum of Russia. 
Peter's extension of state power and the expansion of his empire culminated in the construction of a new capital city, which was St. Petersburg. So he imitated Louis the Fourteenth in this respect. Alexei's and Peter's introduction of Western influences came along with other ideas that weren't going to be quite so welcome in Russia. Some of the nobles began arguing that service to the state, and not just birth, should help to determine noble rank. So what's interesting is they bring in these Western traditions because they want to kind of pull Russia kicking and screaming into their modern era. But at the same time, that's going to begin friction with traditional Russian culture that even the czars themselves aren't willing to let go of. A kind of quick note here on the beard. So as you can see with Peter's own image, he looks very Western in his, um, in his personal fashion choices, wearing just the little mustache and not the big heavy beard. Rumor has it that Peter was so insistent about the shaving of Russian beards that if an unshaved noble came and spoke with him, he got them to lean in very close and then he'd surprise them with a swipe of scissors where he'd cut off the beard and then force them to shave it off there in his presence. So he was very serious about not just the um, adoption of German and French styles, but truly making the, French, the uh, Russian court look more French or German. So if we look back at these absolutists who emerge in the later 17th century, who emerge in response to Louis XIV, what we see is the centralization of state, which is usually done through the accumulation of a standing army, through the expansion of a bureaucracy, and through some sort of negotiation between the monarch or the leader and the nobility to allow for this more efficient bureaucratic centralization. Now, how the Enlightenment plays into all of that is what we'll look at next.